tuning in, and you are listening to Restitutio, a podcast that seeks to recover authentic Christianity and live it out today. Renowned historical Jesus scholar and Princeton Theological Seminary professor Dale Allison's life changed forever when he was just 16 years old. In fact, he has chronicled no less than nine profound spiritual experiences throughout his life. These extraordinary moments of transcendence led him to a comparative study to learn more about what is happening to people all around the world in our time. The result? A book that catalogs and describes weird encounters with angels in white, sudden terminal lucidity, near-death experiences, and even encounters with evil spiritual entities. This is not the typical sort of book written by someone who has made a career of scholarship within a guild that generally prefers naturalism and reductionism to the miraculous or inexplicable. Nonetheless, now tenured at Princeton and sitting atop a mountain of published successes and without concern about his career, Professor Allison feels free to explore his own numinal experiences as well as those of a staggering number of others most of whom keep such experiences to themselves. And this is one of the main reasons he wrote this book, was to encourage people to speak up and to be able to talk about the sorts of spiritual or supernatural, call it whatever you want, encounters that people do have throughout the course of their lives. Here now is episode 468, Touching the Supernatural, with Dr. Dale Allison. Welcome, everyone, to Restitutio. I'm your host, Sean Finnegan, and today with me in conversation is Professor Dale Allison of Princeton Theological Seminary, and today we're talking about his book, Encountering Mystery, which is published by Erdman's. Professor Allison, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for joining me today. Happy to be here. Uh, We were just chatting a little bit before we started and uh, talking about your background and sort of like the rules by which the game is played in the academy. This book is really stepping outside your your lane, in a sense, covering some interesting and potentially topics that could get you in trouble (laughs) if you were maybe a little younger scholar. Uh, could you share a little bit about your motivation for writing this? Well, first first of all, I'm not a younger scholar, so I have no more promotion committees uh, to face. And so that makes this uh, a lot easier. This really is a book that I started to write many years ago. I actually wrote a book related to this in the 90s, but I didn't have a full-time teaching job. And I knew that if I published it, I would never get a job. So I've waited until... I've worked my way through through my career to do this. I, I view this as just being honest and being at a point in my career where I can be honest. I know how to play by the rules of the historian's game, and I, I don't just go through the motions. I am an historian, and I am, a, I am full of doubt, despite everything, and I believe in critical tools and so on. At the same time, I don't have a a reductionistic or materialistic worldview, and I I never have. And I suppose this book enables me to say that that clearly. Uh, You could, if you went through some of my earlier books, find hints of what's here in footnotes if you read very carefully. But nobody, nobody noticed those hints before. There are things that I've never seen picked up on, and they... They all have to do with religious experience and some of the topics of this book. So that tells you where the the guild is. You just ignore certain things that don't fit fit the usual rules. Yeah, it seems like there there are two camps that are fairly well defined. You've got the, uh, you know, I believe in miracles and and sort of uncritically, and then you've got on the other side. No, I'm a, a real scholar, and we all know that naturalism is just the default worldview for historiography, at least. Yeah, uh-huh. uh, and you're you're really uh, kind of stepping in between those two camps, and that makes you vulnerable <laughs> to take fire from both, right? Yeah, it, it does, and it's also a, a difficult position to be in intellectually because I am a, a doubter. For example, I know because I've I've studied the you know the stories of the saints, legends of the saints. 
that religious literature is full of things that you would call legends and that everybody would agree are legends. And many of them have to do with the miraculous, right? They, they just do. And so there's this habit, which is justified of whenever you run into a miracle thinking, what's the real explanation or what, what's the alternative to a, a literal interpretation? The problem is, is that I also think both as an historian and as a human being that there are things that happen that don't fit our usual reductionistic categories. There are things that I can't explain in my own life, in the lives of people I'm close to, and uh, a few things in history that I think resist uh, easy explanation. And so that makes me a doubter and a believer at, at the same time. So yeah, that is a, a difficult space to be in. Yeah. Uh, you, you talk about some of your own personal experiences. You lead off of that in the book and uh, experiences of the transcendent. And you, re you remark on the, the difficulty of acquiring good statistics of mystical experiences throughout. You kind of like bang this drum of like, why, why can't we get better data here? For you, it's, it's pretty easy to see why this would be something you would keep under your hat considering the, the pressures of the academic world and the, uh, the sort of standard way of talking about religious experience. But like your average person on the street, you say over and over throughout the book, you're like, only once I made, it a, uh, made somebody comfortable enough uh -huh. that I wasn't going to ridicule them would they open up to me about this strange experience they had of the noumenal. So uh, why do you think it is that way? Well, I, th I think there are at least two reasons. One is secular and one is ecclesiological. So the secular reason is that most of us simply, even if we go to church, grow up with a secular education. And we learn, even if it's not explicit, that certain things are not mainstream or certain things are marginal. So you learn to think about history without miracles. There were no miracles anywhere in my public school uh, education, which included college. And in fact, when I got to college, uh, miracles were pretty much explained away or just, just laughed at. So I learned that there is a class of experiences that educated people, educated people don't pay attention to, or when they do, they ridicule them, right? That's there. And of course, you know, we have some scientists who are outspoken materialists and, you know, we may run across them once in a while and, and things get reinforced. The other explanation, I think, is ecclesiological. And uh, at least within the so-called mainstream Protestant churches, which go back to the Reformation, there's a very rich heritage of dismissing anything that's weird or abnormal so what, what happens actually is that the reformers, Luther and Calvin and, and others, have to discredit Roman Catholicism. And Roman Catholicism is full of miracles. It's, it's full of miracles. And many of them, miracles, for example, associated with the Eucharist, with the host, or with Mary, or saints and shrines, they seemed to support Roman Catholic doctrine. And so the, the best way to deal with them was to dismiss them. And early Protestants became very adept at, at saying, well, that's just a legend, or somebody was lying, or that's a psychological issue, or you've seen a hallucination, that sort of thing. So actually, most of the, the modern skeptical moves are already there in a nutshell, or, you know, implicitly there in the 16th century with the early Protestant critiques of Roman Catholicism. And then you develop already in the 16th century, Calvin is thinking along these terms and says, well, he's inclined to this. He's not dogmatic about it. But the view that miracles simply stopped in the first century or very soon after the New Testament appeared, because the idea is that miracles were ways of accrediting prophets, ways of accrediting Jesus. And once you have the prophets and Jesus in books, you don't need accrediting miracles anymore. So that's known as cessationism. And it's been mainstream in the mainstream churches that became dominant in uh, Anglicanism, in the Reformed or Presbyterian tradition. And then it gets invoked from time to time 
when you run into to groups of charismatics, for example, that you don't like. So when the early Methodists showed up, the early Methodists, they, they seemed kind of wild to some mainstream Protestants, and they were dismissed as enthusiasts. Enthusiasts um, enthusiasm was a cuss word in that context, right? It's a bad word. You don't want to be an enthusiast. And in the early 20th century, we then have the advent of Pentecostal and charismatic movements, at least here in the United States. And uh, mainstream churches don't like them. Uh, they are associated with fundamentalism and everything that people are opposed to in the mainstreams. And so, again, there's a tradition of dismissing that. You don't look at it and say, well, I don't like some of this theology and some of this is weird, but maybe there's something interesting going on here. You just dismiss it. It's the same move that the Protestants made with Roman Catholicism. They didn't really ask, most of them, are some of these miracles well attested? And if so, what would they mean? They just dismissed them. So I grew up in a Presbyterian church and then a congregational church, and there, there were no miracles in sight. They were in the Bible, but that was it. And you quickly came to believe that if anyone thought otherwise, there was something wrong with them. I was, I was raised to think that Pentecostals are uneducated fundamentalists, and they're naive, and they're deceived about everything, and we don't need to pay them any attention. It's just, that's just what I got. Yeah, it, they're they're hallucinating. They're having subjective, delusional experiences, or they're overinterpreting, or they're being superstitious. Yeah. It sounds like modernism, really. Yeah, it, but but you as you see, modernism then joins up with parts of the ecclesiastical tradition, at least here in the so-called West. Mm -hmm. But uh, now we're on uh, in a new age, uh, an age of postmodernism, where suddenly we can we can talk about miracles and we can think about unusual spiritual experiences. If you don't want to call it a miracle, and uh, suddenly suddenly it's okay everywhere except for historical Jesus scholarship. Or new, <laughs> well, you know, <laughs> the rest of society is like, oh yeah, let, maybe that happened. I don't know. So, so I think you have to be careful here. So the sociological research that I've seen does indicate that people are more open-minded than they used to be, let's say, 60 years ago. They're also more inclined to share their stories with others. But there are still tons of people out there who engage in what I call self-censorship. That is, who have experiences, and even now in this time and place, don't share them with anybody or not not with more than one person. They feel embarrassed or potentially embarrassed. This has happened a lot in my, my experience. People have shared things with me once they have found out who I am and said, I haven't told anyone else or I just told my husband or something like that. That's actually a refrain in the book. I quote people saying that again and again and again because it is it is still there. Now, my own view here is that we're pretty much driven by entertainment, as we're watching screens all the time. And if you look at the entertainment industry and the explosion after cable TV and all this stuff we have now and the X-Files and so on, people do seem to, at least according to the opinion polls, be open-minded about all sorts of things, or at least the majority is. So I think there is some genuine movement there, but you have to be careful because these surveys, they put all sorts of things together and they include miracles with Bigfoot, miracles with the Loch Ness Monster, miracles with UFOs, which is a gigantic category, undefined almost always in these polls. And so it's really messy. And I'm not in this book interested in UFOs or Bigfoot or witchcraft, or any number of things. I'm interested in a, a certain number of what I think are specific types of experience, trying to figure out what's going on with them. But you're right, we're a little more open, although that refrain can also be heard in the literature of the 1960s and early 70s. People are saying back then, oh yeah, we're opening up, we're more open-minded, uh, and, and so on. And that was true. But you can also, I found these sorts of comments also at the beginning of the 20th century, which makes me wonder if we're always thinking 
that things are changing and maybe they're not always changing that much or maybe a lot more slowly than we think. Mm -hmm. Well, you talk about some of your own experiences, which I really appreciated, the, the vulnerability, the honesty, the transparency to talk about some of these. Uh, you chronicled nine experiences on a little piece of paper oh. in your desk drawer between 1979 and 1999. And uh, I thought that was really interesting that you made the effort to maintain your memories of these different events. Uh, I think a, a lot of us would just sort of allow those memories to collect dust and uh, fade away over time. Uh, what, what drove you to do that? I mean, that's kind of an unusual uh, practice, but I think it served you well, obviously, in, in producing this book. Well, so, so first of all, I've, uh, although my theology has developed it and changed, my infatuation with religion and Christianity and the Bible really goes back to when I was 16 and had a sort of transformational mystical experience. So I've always known how profound religious experience can be and how important they are for people or can be for people. Because the, the only reason I'm talking to you today is because of some outrageous event that happened to me when I was 16 years old. Now, shortly after that, when I was 18 in my first semester of college, the uh, professor in the intro to religion class did want to debunk everything I thought, but God bless him, he gave me or he, he assigned the class William James's variety of religious experiences. And I fell in love with that then. And I assigned that to uh, my students in one of my classes. And that then, I think, opened up my eyes and gave me a really genuine lifelong interest in this subject. And then when I had later experiences once in a while, I would go try to find parallels to them. I would try to figure out what's going on here. Is there an obvious chemical explanation? Have the neuroscientists figured out what's wrong with me and it's just some you know glitch up here? Uh, is what has happened to me common? So... If something happens to me, I want to know if it happened to other people. And it's really hard to generalize from my own experience, or at least that's very, very hazardous. So I want a bunch of experiences or a bunch of firsthand reports that I can look at and then make generalizations uh, about as an, as an aggregate. That's the safest way to do things. You don't want to just look at your own experiences, whatever they are, visions or mystical raptures and and so on and say okay this is what they mean you have to be careful you have to be critical you have to pay attention to the skeptics and the debunkers and certainly you have to pay attention to the scientists you just just to the real science you just have to so you know the way you do that is to try to study all all this stuff and i guess i have been doing that my whole life and this book then re reflects that part of me. Yeah. You uh, have shared about this experience in a, a number of interviews you've already done. I, I hate to ask you again, but I know if I don't, my listeners will never forgive me. <laughs> Could you just, in a nutshell, explain what happened when you were 16 and uh, that, that 20 to 30 seconds that just pff, knocked you onto this path early in life? So the answer is yes, I can do that. But... Having said that, I always have to preface this with the fact that this is not a verbal experience, and I'm taking it and I'm trying to put it into words. And when I put it into words, it doesn't really make sense, but that's all I can do. I put it into words for myself soon after it happened. That's really all I can do. Actually, when I sit back and try to recreate it, I know everything I'm doing is sort of like a, a parable or a, a metaphor because I can't get back into it. Uh, this was a summer evening. It was between my junior year in high school and my senior year in high school. I was out in my parents' backyard. I was living at home. I hadn't gone off to college yet. This was uh, Wichita, Kansas, 1972. And you could still see the stars. Uh, from my parents' backyard. Things weren't as bad as they are now. I was just sitting there alone. I have no recollection of what I was thinking or worrying about. And then just somewhere out of the blue, this must be 9.30 or 10 o'clock, it was as though something switched. 
And it was as though, as though the stars came down and surrounded me and their purpose or function was to announce the presence or the advent or the arrival of some something uh, with a capital S, right? And this something with a capital S was affectionate and loving, but also other and different and holy and a bit scary, maybe. I'm not quite sure. There's some kind of fear mixed in with this affection. It's very strange. It, yes, well, everything's all ramped up here. And the sense is that this, this is real. This is the real thing or person or reality. The way I've always expressed this was that the world flipped. So it was like, my life as a teenager was the real thing. And then religion and God were up here sort of abstract. And, uh, you know, I believed in God. I said prayers, even once in a while looked at the Bible because I thought maybe I should. But this was the overwhelming sense that whatever this is that has run into me or that, that I've run into, whatever it is, this is the real thing. This is the reality. This is what really matters. And compared to this, everything else matters not as much all right as opposed to a dream in which you're you're thinking oh. this is not real this is like just a, a visionary no. experience it was the opposite of that it was like more real than regular life yeah so so that's actually something that occurs a lot with so-called mystical experiences it occurs often with near-death experiences people will say this was more real than real now, I don't know what to do with that. I want to accept that at face value, but I have read a couple of studies where the neuroscientists say that, you know, there's some sort of chemical thing which can create in your head the notion that what you're seeing is more real than real. And people sometimes also say this with regard to, to drugs. My own response to that is that we can create artificial experiences of everything, it doesn't mean there aren't real experiences, right? So if you have artificial reality, it doesn't mean there isn't a real reality. And so that's how I think about that. Uh, but inside the experience, whatever this was, it was not at all like a dream, just nothing like a dream. This is an expansion of awareness or an intensification of awareness. It's the opposite uh, of, of a dream or anything blurry. It's just it's just right there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I can I can see the words failing you as you're trying to like externalize this this memory. You you can't do that, but that's another motif in the literature, right? This happened and mystics will go on and on about what happened to them. They don't shut up, but they do always preface their comments by I can't put it into words or it's ineffable. That's a really nice word, ineffable. Uh, I can't can't speak it. Have you come across Blaise Pascal's Night of Fire? Oh, yeah. Pascal is one of my heroes. Yeah. And uh, so he, he wrote down that experience on a little piece of paper and put it in his, his house jacket and never told anyone about it. That's true. That's true. Isn't that something? And he just called it fire from like a certain time to a certain time fire you know and then he's like I knew that the God of Abraham was the true yeah. God and, and so on. It's just incredible. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's incredible, especially given who Pascal was. Pascal was a genius. He's one of those human intellects that has more power and ability than, than the rest of us. You know, we, we do have these people who are true geniuses. He's one of them. Very fortunately, within a few months of this experience, I had a wise older person who gave me Pascal's pensées, gave me his book of thoughts, and I read through it, and I was in love with it. I read it again, then I read it again. And I've lectured on Pascal off and on over the years. And again, he's one of my, uh, he's one of my favorites. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I can see why you would be attracted to his uh, style and his way of going about things. Uh, let's talk about the dark side. You related some stories of people in the book who experienced love or joy or light, and then others who felt terrified by their experience. 
And one of the more interesting uh, experiences you you sort of codified and explained a little bit was the old hag experience. I had never heard of this before, but what's crazy is that uh, I was just talking to somebody last week, and I was at a, a theological conference, and I was telling him about your book and how I have this interview, and I'm so excited to talk to Professor Dale Allison, and he's like, "Oh, you got that interview, you know?" And uh, I said, "I said, yeah." He talks about this old hag and this this experience, and he's and I explain it just a little bit, and he's like, "I've had that, and so has my wife." So, uh, <laughs> could you tell a little bit about that and what we're talking about here? So I'm generalizing here, and you know, the experts are going to say, "Well, there are." dominant components of this experience. And then there are motifs that show up once in a while. So I'm going to blur all that. But I've actually had this twice. So I'll just speak out of that. You wake up, you wake up, you've been sleeping, you're in a sound sleep. And when you wake up, you can't breathe. And you're in a complete panic. And you feel like there's some oppressive or evil force in the room. Sometimes it feels like there's something on your chest. And if, if, if I couldn't put into words the experience I had when I'm 16, I, I think it's also hard to put this into words because it's genuine terror. It's great fear. And you are just petrified out of your mind. All right. Just petrified out of your mind. I don't know how to communicate that. One part of this experience that's strange, but fairly common is that people will not only sense an evil presence in the room, but they often sense it towards their feet. And then more often than not, way more often than not, off to the left side. And they sometimes don't just sense it. They sometimes see it sort of like uh, a a very dark shadow. And the the experience is that it's menacing or that uh, it's threatening. It means you harm. It wants to do you ill. And so what usually happens to people in this experience is that they're panicked and they're trying to breathe. And usually within five seconds or so, they can do so. And the whole thing, the whole whole scenario just disappears. Now, as I understand it, we do have some understanding of the paralysis because when you dream, your body creates a chemical so that you do not act out the dream. The best illustration is always for those of you who have had dogs or cats, you've seen them dream. You've seen them move their paws like this when they're asleep or they're chewing or eating and their mouths move just a little bit. Well, we do the same sort of thing. And it's because there's a chemical that inhibits our muscles from acting out what we're doing. When we're dreaming about running, we don't want to run. Okay. So the theory here is, and you know, it may be correct. I'm not an expert in this, but the theory is that what's happening is you're waking up in the middle of some state where that chemical is still there. And so you can't move. Now, why you also feel that you can't breathe, I don't know. But on both occasions when I had it, and this is a central part of of the experience, it's like you've had the wind knock out of you, or you've had your lungs collapse, you just can't get it, right? And you feel like you're you're going to die. Now, why this is in the book is because it's so often associated with the sense of an evil presence. For that, I don't know what the medical or reductionistic explanation would be. I also do know that there are occasions on which um, more than one person has been in the same room and had a very similar experience Uh, So they both feel it was somehow related to the room. Also, I have a case of somebody I I knew who was in bed with his young son, and this happened to him. And the son the next morning said he also saw the black shadow, you know, over in that part of the room. So uh, that's interesting. But here's what there are two things that are really important about this. One is that it happens to people who don't know it's common. And they're often terrified and they often don't speak of it and they don't know that it's a known syndrome and it helps to know that it's there and it helps to know that it's not going to kill you 
and it helps to know there are actually people now who uh, can talk to you about this experience and help you deal with it. So there are actually some therapists out there now. But this happens to 20% of our population. Unbelievable. <laughs> that's Isn't a that huge number. So that's a huge number. It happens to at least 20% uh, of us uh, over the course of our life. And yet it's something we don't know about. For me, that- And we it, don't talk about. We don't talk about it. And that's symbolic of many other things that are going on in this book. Things that are common and that do go on. And yet there is a large public ignorance about this. The medical community itself, before the publication of a of an important book in the early '80s, was unaware of this as a as a syndrome. Right? It just hadn't put the pieces together, and didn't didn't recognize it. But the second thing that's interesting is that I think, again, as an historian, uh, this probably is one of the uh, contributing factors to a belief that there are evil spirits or evil beings because people simply have had this experience. That's true no matter what the explanation is. You would still be a reductionist or a materialist or give this a medical explanation, but it's still the case that people have the sense or feeling or even the vision of this hateful, evil thing that's out there. And there are so are on, so we have on record some modern people who said, I used to think the devil was a myth, and then I had this experience, now I've changed my mind. So I think that tells you that experiences can actually lead to changes in belief and can contribute to the emergence of beliefs. I don't know how to show this on a on a, a universal human scale, but I'm confident, given how widespread this experience is, given how it's been mythologized all over the world, right? It's in myths uh, everywhere. It, it's There's something going on here. Well, something is going on, but I was just going to make the historian's point. Religious people don't just sit around and make things up. They just don't say, okay, let's, let's invent Satan. Wouldn't that be a good idea? <laughs> they actually- We can blame him for everything. <laughs> they, they're trying- often, I think, to make sense of things that happen to people, to things that have happened to them or reports they have from others. So I think this is a, an illustration of, of that phenomenon. Yeah. Would you be willing to talk about your daughter a little bit? I guess uh, you mentioned in the book she had an experience. I'm not going to get you in trouble here talking about this. Uh, well, I'm, I'm, I'm going to see her tomorrow. She's coming down. I won't tell her I did this. Uh, well, actually, her experience is so bizarre and so weird, and it didn't happen to me, that I don't know really how to put it into words. But she woke up one morning, and she was alone in bed, and I don't know, this was, I'm trying to think, she would have been maybe a teenager, or maybe she was 20 years old. Instead of one, you know, mal uh, malicious spirit or presence or force. She saw several things and they were hateful and they were mocking her. They terrified her, completely terrified her. She actually, you know, put uh, her head under the covers to, to get away from this and then waited a few minutes and then got out and they were gone. So I don't know what this was. I'm not going to pretend that I know metaphysically what this was. And I can't tell you she wasn't hallucinating. What I can tell you is that this was an important experience in her life. She told me recently that she suffered from post-traumatic stress syndrome for a decade. After this, it was so intense and so horrible and so evil. But... There's another part of this that is significant to me, which is she came and told me we were we were staying at a cottage uh, that we owned. And she came and told me that very morning, right after it happened, she came and told me about this event uh, because she knew I was open minded. And what she said after her narrative was, but, dad, you can't tell anyone because they'll think I'm crazy. All right. So that's the important part. Even if you think this is a hallucination, she's a normal person. She's mentally healthy. There's nothing wrong with her. 
and that she can't talk about something that really happened to her and something at least subjectively and that was so overwhelmingly uh had decade long effects uh w- that's just wrong so that's one of the reason i uh, reasons i wrote this book i want yeah, to yeah you're encourage- speaking out i want to encourage people to be open minded i know so many pastors that when they hear anything out of the ordinary they just want to change the subject quickly I'll, <laughs> really really uh or they're just you know they they condescendingly listen but they're not really interested and they're as skeptical as a uh, you know a secular skeptic would be but that doesn't deal with people's real life that is people don't just want a condescending, you know, okay, uh, that's your experience. Pat on the and then, head, yeah. yeah, and then we we go on. Things like this are at the very least, from a psychological point of view, important for people. But there's also the pastoral issue that people in our time and place often associate their experiences with God or with angels or with demons, and they're trying to do their own theology in response to things that have happened to them. And it's abdicating responsibility for a pastor not to have any interest or not to want to participate, or worst of all, to my mind, not to have any knowledge of of this sort of thing, not to be able to say, okay, well, that's a common experience. Here's what people think about it. Here are the options for interpretation, taking people seriously rather than dismissing them. Thank you for sharing that. I appreciate it. Let's let's talk about angels. <laughs> yeah. Look, you okay. wrote the book, so it's fair game, right? Yeah. <laughs> so you talk about the AIW, Angel in White. Yeah. And you talk about these anti gravity stories and people either nearly falling off a roof and getting <laughs> caught or falling off something and then floating downwards. Yeah. Uh, these uh, these are especially hard for people to believe since they aren't I mean, these are these are objective experiences that were oftentimes even witnessed by somebody else. Uh, what what is going on here with these angel stories? So first of all, that that is the most. I think it's the most critical chapter in the book. So I'm not saying so and so told a story and I believe it. I'm looking at reports, and by the way, most of these come out of these popular books on angels, which have been selling really well since the late 80s and early 90s. And again, I think that we abdicate our responsibility when as theologians or as pastors, we pay no attention to what people in the pews are reading. And they are not reading Jürgen Moltmann. They're not reading Wolfhard Pannenberg. They're reading the latest book on angels, right? And so you should have something to say to them uh, about that. So I got this interest in these books many years ago. And it was in part because many of these books were just collections of first person narratives. That is, people were simply saying, this happened to me, this happened to me, this happened to me. And I thought, well, if I have enough of these, maybe I can begin to make some generalizations about them. And one of the things I do, as you indicated, is I started putting these stories into piles. Here are the anti-gravity stories. Here are the angel in white stories. Here are the guiding voice stories where, you know, a voice says, do this or don't do that. And it turns out to be for the good. And then people say, oh, it must be an angel, right? My guardian angel or something like that. What I did is I went through these books and I sorted these experiences out and discovered there are seven or eight types of experiences that occur again and again and again. And then I was critical of some of them. And of course, most of these stories, I I don't know the people involved. In this case, I'm actually reading books. Although, by the way, uh, just as a footnote, two or three days ago, I had a man email me and told me a story about his daughter falling down the stairs and uh, the mother was in the room and the child flew. She didn't fall down. She, you know, went off in some not straight down way. Okay. So I don't know that, you know, it's just somebody writing me who read the book and was sharing his story. Uh, I don't believe him. I don't disbelieve him. It's just for me, more, more data. But some of these stories, as you indicate, have more than one witness. And when you have something like that, then it seems to me that 
if you're intellectually honest, you should be open-minded, not uh, uncritical, right? Not credulous, but you should be open-minded. Yeah, and the whole dismissing everything that <clears throat> sounds untrue to naturalism, you know, that, that, that hand-waving move, you're saying over and over, that's not intellectually honest to just, I mean, it's, if it was just one or two, sure, that person's superstitious. They had a hallucination. They have an agenda. They're trying to make money. You know, like that one kid that went to heaven and then, you know, oh, yeah. revealed uh-huh. later on that it was just made up or whatever. Sure, a isolated case here or there, but you're aggregating all of this and, and you're saying, you know, this is just too much. And, it, and especially when you put together all the different categories that you cover in this book, all the different chapters, uh-huh. it's just too much to say there's a reductionistic safe space to flee to here. Yeah. So, so again, I'm very careful here. I'm very critical in this chapter, but I do say there are some stories here, which if they happened as presented, really do resist a reductionistic explanation. And if I were in such a story, I give a couple of examples. If I were in such and such a story, uh, then I would probably say an angel did this because that's the language of my, you know, my Christian tradition. That's the the natural thing to say. But these books are, some of them are not very sophisticated and some of the authors are credulous. But again, it seems to me that if you have a hundred stories saying relatively the same thing, from a bunch of different people who don't know each other, then that's at least cause to investigate. So actually, I think that what I'm doing here in the book is a, is being a little bit like a natural historian. You go on a, a voyage and you see a tree that you haven't seen before, and then you find other trees like it. And once you find a bunch of trees, you have a new species, right? And then you can observe it and make generalizations about it. You know, it turns yellow in the fall and it drops its fruit and it looks like this. We now know enough that we can make some generalizations about a lot of religious experiences. I think that we've made a lot of progress since William James at the beginning of the 20th century. We say a lot about the old hag syndrome. I, I'm trying to make a start with these angel stories by trying to sort them into categories and asking questions about, about them. We can say things about this sense of being enveloped by a transcendent loving something, invisible force, invisible divinity. There's a lot of interesting work being done on voices now. There are lots of interesting things being done about deathbed visions. People are starting to have some statistics and starting to make generalizations. And near-death experiences have been studied pretty carefully you know, for the last 40 years. Again, I think it's possible to make some generalizations about these. So to my mind, the subjects in this book aren't just a sort of unsortable mess. I'm actually looking at things that have been or are in the process of being sorted And as they are sorted, we can make generalizations about them. So I've been greatly influenced by um, a a biologist who taught at uh, Oxford named Alistair Hardy. Well, the word I was going to use is taxonomy. Yeah. uh It seems like you're developing a taxonomy. And he did this. His theology was fairly liberal. He was a Unitarian, but he was really interested in religious experience. He, he was uh, an expert, I believe, in uh, ocean mammals or something like that, right? But he also had this interest in religion. So at Oxford in the late 60s, he started this division in which they began to collect the stories of people. And, you know, originally it was just advertising in newspapers and, and, and that sort of thing way back then or on the, the BBC, whatever. But he began to get flooded then, by the way, this is secular Britain, you know, this is 60s and 70s and 80s, get flooded with all these testimonies. And he did what I am doing with angels. He would say, okay, this is a vision of a figure of light. So all the visions of figures of light, we're going to put over here. And then all the experiences of evil presences, we're going to put them over here. And then all the near-death experiences, they're going to go over here. And all the experiences of a transformed uh, natural landscape, 
So you're right. It's a taxonomy. And he began to make generalizations from the testimony that surrounded these stories. You know, I was walking through the woods when this happened. Right. Or I was listening to classical music when this happened. I mean, he was looking for common triggers and that sort of thing. So a lot remains to be done. But again, I think I'm dealing with areas of knowledge, not just uh, wooey speculation of uh, naive religious people. Yeah. Yeah, you talk about uh, a couple of other categories. Obviously, if uh, people really want to know about all the categories, they can get the book. But um, one of the more interesting ones was the uh, experience of sudden lucidity on the deathbed uh, that occurs uh, with some frequency. And, you know, one statistic you had in there was that something like 60 percent of uh, people are, are, are experiencing some sort of dream or vision as they're coming to die. Um, uh, could you talk about that a little bit? So you're mixing two categories there. Terminal lucidity is one thing. And then these visions uh, around deathbeds are, are another thing. But terminal lucidity was named in the 21st century. I mean, it's not even a concept before the last, I don't know, the guy who named this named this in 2008 or 2010, something like that. And he had found enough cases historically, you know, just a case here or there. And he brought them together. And there was some anecdotal evidence from our own time. And he said, I think this might be a real phenomenon. So this is the phenomenon of somebody who's been completely out of it, somebody who is dying, somebody who has had Alzheimer's for months or even years or some other truly debilitating mental condition, occasionally somebody whose brain has been eaten by a tumor. And then shortly before death, this person will have a few moments or an hour or so of lucidity, and they will appear to gain their mental facilities back completely. They'll be able to converse, they know what's going on, and then they slip away and then, then they die. So this is now being studied by mainstream scientists. They're trying to study it in part because they're trying to figure out if there are th things going on that can help us with uh, the treatment of Alzheimer's, right? But, but it is a really weird experience, especially in people who have had uh, brain tumors and the experts say, you know, they don't have enough brain left to, you know, do what they just did, that kind of, of thing. I did find an old German writer writing about 1930 who had some of these cases. And he, he said, well, I think maybe we have here evidence for the soul because, you know, they're really, they're really gone and their brains are messed up, but they're still able to do this. Aside from this, I mean, it's not something you should expect or look forward to. You know, if you have a you know, a loved relative or friend, and that person is is gone. You shouldn't expect that you know anything else. But it does happen enough that it's now a recognized uh, phenomenon. But the other thing you mentioned, the visions at bedsides. These are really common, and they are being studied now, being studied intensively in a number of places around the world. Really interesting results from a hospice in Buffalo. They're discovering that. These visions, which are usually of relatives or friends, once in a while, there's a figure they don't recognize, or they'll call an angel, or they might say Jesus, but usually they're dead friends or relatives. And these people who are seeing them, the, the statistic here uh, is really high. I can't remember whether it's 98% or 99, but it's really high that say, I'm not hallucinating I think this is real. And also occasions of people who said, you know, I used to be a skeptic or I thought when you're dead, you're dead. Uh, I don't buy this religious bunk, but now I'm having second thoughts about what the heck, uh, you know, reality is, or there's something more here for me after I'm, I'm gone. That stuff's really interesting. And again, it's going on at a quick pace. I would guess in 10 years from now, we'll have some really good, solid data. Right now, the, the different people who are doing research aren't coordinating how they gather statistics, and it's kind of a, a, a mess. I will add 
that in reading a couple of these very boring reports, you know, just statistics on things, I found two different reports. I remember one of them was from Brazil, which uh, these reports were about deathbed visions. And in these two reports, just in, in one sentence, uh, the authors said, oh, and by the way, the healthcare uh, providers also sometimes see these. And you just think, what the heck is that? You know, what the heck is that? That's more interesting the whole rest of the article. I want that blown up and I want to be told what the heck is that about? Uh, they were just throwaway lines. So I, I, I do know there are stories. I included a few in the book where the person who is in the death process is not the only one to see something remarkable at, at the bed. Those are things that are going to have to be explained away. If you're a, a reductionistic materialist, if you're somebody like me, then you could say maybe this is real. Maybe something uh, is something going, going on, on here, here yeah. right? That's more than hallucination. All right. Well, uh, we're kind of coming to the end of our time, but uh, I, di I did have a couple of quick questions. Might not be quick, uh, but a couple of questions. I just want to put you on the spot a little bit uh -oh. here and ask, what do you think is going on? Do you think there is a, a spiritual dimension or realm that people are, are bumping up against or somebody such as yourself is more susceptible to? Uh, how, how do you make sense of it in your own head? So I don't think that visible reality is the only reality. I don't know whether I should be thinking in terms of multiple dimensions uh, I don't know how to think about this, but I think that there are realities that are not normally visible and that we bump into them or they bump into us once in a while. And I don't think all of these are friendly or affectionate. I do disagree with my with some of my Christian friends because I don't like to think in terms of simply angels and demons. I think that in this other realm, whatever it is, or other realms, I don't, don't know which, which choice to make, that there's probably a spectrum. I think some things that happen just make no sense. They're absurd or they're funny. And I don't know how to say that's a demon or that's an angel. That's just something truly weird for which I have, have no explanation. But in any case, to answer your question, I don't think when I die, I'm dead. I expect to go somewhere else. There are other, other realities and that this normal world that I see out the windows here is only a part of some larger, larger whole. All right, last question. You say on uh, page 82, you ask the question, is it really helpful in this post-Holocaust age to parade stories of miraculous deliverance when they are so few and far between, yeah. when most people in need of rescue never get rescued? And then you say, uh, why would God work a miracle to open a garage door while allowing millions to perish through injustice and hunger? Uh, this, is, this is a major issue and you you raise it a number of times in different ways throughout the book you know the the problem of evil and uh -huh. suffering in light of an active spiritual realm and the possibility of miracles how how would you respond to somebody who says yeah you know i hear what you're saying but there's just, i just can't swallow it because like why would god do this but not that Okay, well, there, that's a big question. First, first <laughs> yeah, no, all, no big deal first, first in 10 all, seconds or less. <laughs> for, first of all, you always have the problem of agency. So even if a miracle occurs, you can ask, what is the agent behind the miracle? Christians are, are really quick to attribute things to God, angels, or demons. I'm a bit slower to, to, to attribute things to God, angels, or demons. I'm often simply puzzled. But if you're asking me for a solution to the problem of evil, I have none. So this is simply a subset of that problem, right? That is, there is unjust suffering everywhere. There is throughout history. We, we preach and believe in a loving God. How do you put those two things together? Those two things on the surface don't go together well, which is why that's the first thing atheists come up with when you ask them for their objection to what it is you believe. In our time and place, that's the most common objection. How could we have a world like this if we have a good God? 
I don't have an intellectual answer to that. I accept my own experience and the testimony of many others and the weight of my theological tradition that the divine spirit and reality behind and underneath all of this, the source from which it comes, is a loving reality. And I believe that that reality wins in the end, however that looks, right? But I have no explanation for that. I take a little stab in the book, I think, at talking about the limits of human reasoning and the limits of my mammalian mind. I take that seriously. Uh, If there is a God and if there's an invisible world and if there are spirits and things like that, the odds that I'm going to have a map or figure out much of anything are minuscule at, at best. So I have to take refuge in a, in a mystery. I hope that's not, I hope that's not a cowardly or cheap thing to do. I don't think it is because I've been thinking about this my whole life, right? It's not as though I I looked at this problem when I was 18 and I said, I'm going to call it a mystery and never think about it again. I continue to bump up against it and direct my brains and to read what people uh, say about it and to study theologians and philosophers and all the rest trying to come to terms with it. It's uh, the great problem for us, I think, as Christians. And I don't have your your answers. I also don't have a theological answer to why some people seem to have mystical raptures and wonderful spiritual experiences, and other people just go through life. And they might as well be atheists, even though they go to church, because nothing interesting is ever, they think, where they report happened to them. I have no explanation, at least theological explanation for that. It might be genetic, but that's not a theological explanation. That's just more unfairness, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, I do appreciate your unwillingness to take refuge in pat answers. <laughs> uh, I think that's uh, that's really great. And I appreciated the tone in the book. Uh, once again, it's called Encountering Mystery. And, uh, you know, you're not saying uh, you have to believe all of this, shove it down all our throats and say, you know, naturalism and reductionism are stupid and don't believe them. What you're saying is, look, these are, these are events and experiences that happen. They're happening at a staggering rate in our, not only in history, but in our world today. Uh-huh. And, and we have little bits of reportages here and there on, and, and we can categorize them and we can, we can take this stuff seriously uh, without just believing it uncritically. And uh, so I really appreciate your your work on this. Where can people go to learn more about you uh, if they're interested in your in your Le- work? Learn about me. I don't want anyone to know anything about me except that I, I, I want them to read my books. So okay. they should go look on uh, Amazon and then you can push, uh, you know, my name under whatever book it is. And that will list my books because that's who I am. I'm a writer. I teach And I work hard at teaching and I want to be a good teacher, but I'm a writer and my life is, is the books that I have produced. So yeah, I want people to read my books. That's why I write them. Yeah. So that's, that's who I am. Thanks for taking the time to talk with me today. Thank you so much for having me. I enjoyed it. Well, that brings this episode to a close. I would love to hear your thoughts. What'd you think about it? Do you have an experience you'd like to share? Do you have an explanation that helps make sense of these things? Uh, Come on over to restitutio.org. It's the word restitution with no N. And find episode 468, Touching the Supernatural with Dale Allison, and leave your feedback there. As far as our previous episode, which was addressing fairly non-theological, but yet very important topic on parenting wayward adult children, a number of people wrote in, One named Chris asked the question, do you allow the adult child to move back in with you if they plan on practicing behavior that dishonors God? Uh, I think that was a really good question. And uh, my answer to him was, well, I want to say no, (laughs) but life isn't that simple, and it really would depend on the situation. And then a friend of mine named Bethany wrote in and said, I would think that you would need clearly spoken expectations and boundaries in place like you're allowed to move back but we don't tolerate drunkenness in our house feel free to move in but we want you to contribute in xyz ways 
Otherwise, you're setting the stage for conflict. Wow, some really good practical advice there. And uh, so check out that previous interview if you, especially if you have adult children or even more to the point, wayward adult children. We'll be getting to our science and scripture class next week and starting our exploration of the question of can evolution and the Bible fit together? And so we'll, we'll get back to that next week with our teacher for that class, Will Barlow. So stay tuned for that. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. If you'd like to contribute to Restitutio, you can do that at our website. Donations are certainly appreciated. We'll see you next week. And remember, the truth has nothing to fear.